Oh, it's good to be here, guys. Um, I haven't done an evening service for a while, actually, so it's, it's lovely to... Uh, love, I love the evening service. It's great. Um, so, uh, as Holly said, I'm Karis. Um, I've been at the church for about eight years. Um, my husband was on team here uh, a couple of years ago, um, and uh, we have got four kids, super busy, um, love Jesus. Okay, so that's me, um, and I am going to be talking to you tonight, um, just finishing off this series we've been doing on positive testing, um, and I just, I just get a sense that um, the Lord wants to do some stuff tonight, so I just want to encourage you to, as I start, I just want to encourage you um, just to be ready to hear what the Lord wants to say to you. It's not an accident that you're here tonight. Even if you weren't sure about coming, and it, you kind of were like, mm, not sure, oh, I don't know, and, and you felt awkward walking in, I just feel like the Lord wants you to know that he knows you're here, he knows your name, and he wants you to receive something from him tonight. So just want to just start with that. So um, we are looking at um, Luke 4, 14 to 22. Um, so I'm going to read that to you now. You can flick to it on your phone or you can look at it in a Bible. I don't know if you know this, but there's this app that's been created, where um, a Bible app, where it actually does the sound of flicking pages. I just heard it on a podcast the other day. I was like, that's crazy. That's crazy. Just get the book, people. Just get the book. Anyway, here we go. So um, from verse 14, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit And news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue as was his custom. He stood up to read and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And then he dropped the mic. This is a really brilliant part of the story. Okay, so where have we come from? We've been in the wilderness with Jesus in these last few weeks, haven't we? And we've seen him um, confronting, uh, being with the devil who has been tempting him. You see, we saw him at his baptism before that, where the Holy Spirit came and rested on him like a dove and affirmed him as being God's son. This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. So the Spirit came on him there. Then the Spirit led him into the wilderness where we've been these last few weeks, where he has faced the enemy. And the enemy has been trying to undermine his sonship. If you really are God's son, he said to him in that first one, he said, if you really are God's son, and why don't you make these stones into bread? You see, if you really are God's son, then surely you're entitled to do this in your own strength. You don't really need to depend on your father, do you? And then, if you really are God's son, why don't you throw yourself off this building? Because it says in the scriptures, doesn't it, that he will catch you and you'll be saved. Because Jesus would be going to death, wouldn't he? But, but this was a shortcut. This was a way he could do it without the pain of the cross. This is a way that he could do it and glorify God in a different way, isn't it? And then the last one was, why don't you, um, why don't you bow down to me? Because, because why don't you just have all of that glory without any of the pain? Because one day Jesus will be glorified, won't he? And every knee in heaven and on earth will bow and will declare that he is king. And why? Because he did submit to his father in obedience and he went to the cross. And he didn't do it his way, but he did it God's way. And he overcame, and he overcame. And that's what we have been looking at in these past few weeks. And he's led out of the the wilderness. And the Holy Spirit strengthens him. But he was led into the wilderness in the fullness of the Spirit. And he's come out in the power of the Spirit. And that is key. 
because he's come now not um, in defense, he's on the defensive in the desert, he's come out now on the offensive. Okay, we see almost that victorious music behind him as he stood in this um, synagogue and he's reading this text and he's saying, the spirit of the living God is on me. Now, all of the congregation there, all of these Jewish men would have known the significance of this scripture because he is reading from Isaiah 61. And Isaiah 61 is a, um, a scripture written as a prophetic word to um, the Israelites in exile in Babylon. And it is a scripture declaring their freedom. And it is also um, a scripture declaring the Messiah who is going to come. They would also be thinking about Leviticus. As a, in Leviticus, um, there is this year of jubilee talks about the year of Jubilee. And the year of Jubilee, every, every 50 years, there would be a year where there would be a release of prisoners, that there would be any debts would be paid off. And it was a year of freedom and liberation in, in the Jewish system. And this would be resonating in the minds of these people as Jesus is reading this passage. He is declaring that he is the one who is going to fulfill this word. He is declaring that he is the Messiah. And he says, it's interesting that he stops at the point of saying, today this scripture will be fulfilled in your hearing. Let me just find the bit. He says, um, Today, this scripture will be fulfilled. So, the oppressed free to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now, the actual Isaiah passage says, to declare the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. Now, he doesn't go into that bit. He doesn't go into the judgment of God. He says, I'm here to declare the day of the Lord's favor. This is a time, he is saying, when I am going to step into my ministry. I'm going to begin to move in power in this nation, and he does. This is the point where Jesus goes in and he begins to perform miracles. He begins to bring God's kingdom on earth, and he literally does bring sight to the blind. He, brings, he sets the prisoners free. He sets, he sets those who are imprisoned by demonic powers, he sets them free. We see the lame are healed. We see the deaf can hear. He is bringing in the year of the Lord's favor and freedom. So what does that mean then for us? So let's skip ahead slightly. So Jesus, he, um, he, does, he does his ministry. We see all these things happen. And then he goes to the cross. And then he rises again from the cross. And then we see the disciples, don't we? We see the disciples. Um, Jesus appears to them a number of times. And he comes to them at the end of his time. And he says to them, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. And then it says he breathes on them with his Holy Spirit. So go back and remember, he came out in the power of the Holy Spirit. And at this point, he's breathing on his disciples with the Holy Spirit. And he's saying, as, I am, as the Father sent me, I am sending you. And then in Acts 1, it says, but you will receive power, and he's talking to, the, talking to the disciples, when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So what he has begun, the, 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 church, the disciples will continue by the power of the Holy Spirit. And we see that happen in Acts, when they gather together. They've been told, go to Jerusalem and wait for the gift my father has promised. And they're in an upper room and they are praying. And we know the story. As they're praying there, as they're waiting there, tongues of fire come and rest on the disciples. And they begin to speak in other tongues, don't they? And there's, and there's, people, from, there's, there's people from all nations and they begin to speak and everyone can understand. And they're declaring the goodness of God. Now let me backtrack slightly because in this room, Peter... Peter stands up at that point and he begins to, he's the one who's telling them all about who God is and, and the power and the gospel and he's, 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 he's declaring the goodness of God. But this is the same Peter, guys, who, who just, just a few weeks beforehand, 
he, he's denied that Christ even, he, that he even knew him. This is the same Peter. And this is the same Peter whose name actually originally was Simon. Simon means shifting sand. And, and Jesus at the very beginning comes to him and says, you'll no longer be called Simon, you'll be called Peter. Peter means rock, the rock. And he says to him, and on this rock I will build my church. Now actually Peter doesn't act very rock-like throughout his time with Jesus. You know, we see a lot of, uh, a lot of passion and a, and a lot of kind of mistakes a bit like some of us maybe, a lot of passion maybe with some mistakes along the way. But then what's happened here is the difference is the power of the Holy Spirit has come on Peter. And there is a shift of gear, there's a shift here where he is now doing something that in his own strength, in his own flesh, he would not be able to do. And yet God on him has empowered him to be, to, to be fulfilling the, his kingdom purposes in an incredible way. And I want to suggest, guys, that, that we are now Jesus' body. Just as, as you work out your will through your physical body, Jesus works out his will through his body, the church. You are the church, the body of the living God. And he wants to speak through you. He wants to use you to, to fulfill his kingdom purposes. But we cannot do this in our own strength, church. We cannot do it in our own strength. We need the power of the living God to move in us and rest on us. We need to be filled and to keep on being filled with him. And when I was thinking this, about this today, I was thinking about... Um, you know those moments where you really need electricity and it's not there. So, um, so there was a time when I was, um, so I lived in Malawi for a little bit with David. And uh, we had really regular power cuts. And, um, and that's okay when you're visiting Africa for a short amount of time. But when you're actually living there, it's really, really frustrating. We'd get in from a really long, exhausting day, and I'd, I'd have started to cook dinner, you know, prepping food and stuff. And then suddenly, the power would go. And I had these two little electric hobs. The power would go, and I would literally have to leave it all. And we'd go, and we'd light candles and sit down and wait for the power to come on. And it would, could be three, four hours. I mean, we're not talking you know, 10 to 15 minutes. It could be three or four hours. We'd be waiting there. And, um, and I really learned the value of the power. Do you know what I mean? And I would hear as well, your, my power would go off and you would hear some of the, um, the kind of, the, the houses with the generators. Suddenly they would click into gear and I would be growling inside, so hungry. Um, so anyway, so I knew the value of power. And in fact, I don't know if any of you guys live in Presbury. This is just a little aside, but... Um, we get so many power cuts. Does anyone else? But we, we get so many power cuts in Presbury. I've been so surprised this year. Our power's gone out probably about four or five times. I mean, literally from about five, ten minutes. But still, I have been surprised by the number of power cuts we've had. Um, anyway, I digress. I am talking about the need for power. Okay, we can't do these things in our own strength. Um, I actually did bring a visual. I am a teacher by trade, so obviously I, am, I know the value of a visual. Um, two things. Um, firstly, this. This is a, um, a drone. I don't know if you remember back to your childhood days, or if you have um, any of you parents here have experienced this. When on Christmas Day or birthdays, presents are unwrapped in absolute joy and excitement, and then you realize you do not have enough batteries to put these things into working order. They cannot fulfill their potential without the batteries. Okay, so they, the children get frustrated and upset and you have to run out and get something from Sainsbury's. And, you know. Anyway, and the other thing is the iron. Now, guys, I don't iron. Confession, we're in church, I'm confessing. I don't iron. I did iron back in the day. And, and probably when I first got married, I ironed. But now, no, I do not iron, um, unless I absolutely have to. If I've got a wedding or something, I might iron a shirt. David says he doesn't need me to iron his shirts. He does also iron his own shirts, so let me just put that in there. But um, he doesn't need me to iron his shirts, because if he sweats enough, or if he's hot enough, <laughs> then the creases drop out. 
and all is well. So I'm just, again, <laughs> confessing too much information. I don't know if you've ever tried to use an iron without it having any heat. Have you ever tried to do that? No, because it would be absolutely stupid, wouldn't it? You'd be there for ages. You mean you may as well use a lamp and try and, you know. No, it doesn't work without the heat. And church, we do not work. We cannot do what the Father is asking us to do without the power of the Holy Spirit working in us and through us. It is so key. And in fact, this scripture, this scripture that Jesus said of himself is the same scripture that he would speak over you. So I'm going to read it now. The Spirit of the Lord is on you because he has anointed you to proclaim good news to the poor. And that doesn't just mean the physically poor, though some of you here will be called to set things in motion, to bring freedom practically and physically to the poor. And even as I've said that, there's something stirring in your spirit because you know you are called to do that. But it isn't just the physically poor. It's the spiritually poor. We are living in a generation that is in desperate need of the church to stand up, to wake up and to move in the power of the living God and to be a light and to be his mouthpiece and to bring freedom to the poor. He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind. And that isn't just the physically blind, though God may call some of you. All of us are called to pray for healing for people who are in pain or suffering. Yes, we must pray. And guys, if you've been disappointed in that area because you have prayed in the past and nothing has happened, don't give up. Connect with your heavenly father because he will want to meet with you and speak to you on that point so that you can continue to move in his power because it's him in you that is the hope of glory. It's him in you that is the one who moves and changes and transforms people and situations. It's not you. You did not fail on that point. Come to him if that is a place of pain for you. But we are called to bring sight to the blind Not just the physical blind, the spiritual blind. And there is so much spiritual blindness, isn't there, in our nation? People don't know who they are. They've lost a sense of who they are. They've lost their identity. There is a a desperate need for people to wake up spiritually, to hear the call of their father calling them by name. And that is what he wants to do. And he wants to use us, church. He wants to use us to do that. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. This is the time that we're living in. We can proclaim God's kingdom. We can bring God's kingdom. This is who we are. This is who we are. And so I just want to um, suggest a couple of ways. How do we... How do we do this then? How do we receive God's power? How do we move in power? And I'm going to just suggest a couple of things. First of all, we ask. We ask for his power. And don't get me wrong, guys. You are, you are filled with the Spirit. If you know Jesus, you are filled with the Spirit, okay? And the, but that, the verb about being filled is about keeping, being on, keeping on being filled by him. Okay, And he does move in power in you as we ask for him to come. And then it's about positioning. It's about positioning yourself to encounter him. And what does that look like? Well, I would say there's three things. And it's really annoying because I wanted alliteration and it didn't quite work. I got who... I got word, I got worship, and I got weight. But the who, it does begin with a wh, but it's not phonetically quite satisfying. So anyway, who, know who you are. 
The enemy wants to undermine who you are, like he did with Jesus. If he did it with Jesus, he's going to do it with you. He wants to undermine who you are. And he wants to undermine for you who God is. Okay, so he's going to say to you, like he said to Adam in the garden, did God really say? Would God really do that? He's going to question and question and question. But if you know who your God is, then you will, you will be able to stand. And if you know who you are, because he will come and he will say, if you really are a daughter of God, if you really are a son of the king, then fill in the gap, okay? Know who you are. How do you do that? You do that, guys, by worshipping him and by getting into his word. How did Jesus stand against the devil? How did he do that? He knew his word. The enemy knew it too. The enemy knows the word. Well, the enemy knows the scriptures, but we know the word don't we? Because we know Jesus and he is the word. So get into his word, learn the scriptures. Apparently in our generation, we, are, we, we learn the scriptures less than any other generation that's gone before us because of Google. And that isn't a joke. We just Google a scripture rather than learning it. And actually, guys, it's when we learn it, when it's in our hearts, that's when it comes out. That's when the pressure hits. If the pressure hits and we know our scriptures, we can stand on them. So I want to encourage you, may this be a year where you learn your scriptures, where you get into the word, you get into worship, you'll know who you are. And then you wait. You wait for him to come. And some of you might be sitting there going, do you know, I've not really ever encountered the power of God, really. And I would suggest, guys, that sometimes we need to step into spaces where we need his power to come in order to experience his power. If you can do it in your own strength, then he may not show up into that space. Do you get me? But if you go into a space where you're like, unless you show up, God, then this isn't going to go well. Unless you step into those spaces, then you're not going to experience his power. But know who you are. Know that we are the ones that he is calling to step up, to stand up, to take on his manifesto, which is that Isaiah 61, to bring sight to the blind to set the prisoners free, to proclaim freedom to the captives and the year of favour of the Lord.